Um, thank you for inviting me. The invitation made the trip possible for me. I come to you from um, NCBI, and uh, where I work with uh, Eugene Kunin, who gave a, a talk this morning, which is a, a biological introduction to the, uh, the arms race between uh, viruses and their hosts. And here I will focus on uh, one such mechanism of, of a virus-host interaction, namely the recently discovered uh, adaptive immunity in prokaryotes uh, called CRISPR. For those who of you who missed the, uh, the morning talk, I will briefly explain what, what this uh, system does. Uh, the CRISPR stands for clusters of regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Uh, and uh, uh, the way it works is, uh, is that there's a, this locus of um, palindromic repeats, which sandwich um, nucleotide sequences of about 40 to, to 80 nucleotides long, and uh, associated proteins called CAS, CRISPR-associated proteins. And uh, what, what this locus does is when it's activated, is it transcribes this, uh, this CRISPR cassette, chops it up along the repeats, and then uh, the, uh, these little bits of RNA uh, form a complex with one of the proteins. And when uh, and this complex can uh, recognize DNA that matches the, these little pieces of RNA and cleave it. So uh, uh, in, in, in effect, this, when this locus is activated, it, uh, local, it, it, it identifies and, and destroys in, in DNA that matches these uh, spacers, called, so-called spacers. And the beautiful thing about this CRISPR locus is that uh, these, the spacers come from previous viral infections. So if, if there's a viral infection that somehow the cell survives uh, using some other immunity, if it doesn't already have uh, immunity to it, then uh, the pr other proteins from this uh, CRISPR-associated protein locus uh, go and, and they, they search this uh, invading virus for a certain motif. And uh, they, when they find it, they chop up uh, a little bit of the sequence and insert it into the CRISPR array. Um, so that way, the CRISPR array encodes the history of uh, failed viral infections. So when, in the future, the same virus that has a matching piece of DNA invades, uh, the, the CRISPR array gets activated. And I'm not sure how it does um, gets activated. But when it does, the, uh, the matching spacer that matches the viral protospacer, so this is the terminology, that when, when the bit of sequence is in the virus, it's called protospacer. When it's in the CRISPR array, it's called a, a spacer. When the spacer matches the protospacer, the, viral, the virus is, is uh, cleaved and is no longer active. So this is a, an adaptive immunity, uh, which is, uh, constitutes also Lamarckian evolution, because the whole CRISPR array is, is uh, vertically inherited. Um, so um, it's clear that CRISPR uh, provides certain uh, benefits to, uh, to the prokaryotes that carry it. Um, so it's, it's, it was, it's you know, a bit surprising that it's not ubiquitous. Although it's pretty widespread, it's not ubiquitous. Uh, and, and here is some data from our recent paper uh, with, in, in, in MBio, which shows, um, which models the, the system. But in, among that, uh, in, in, there's, there's some uh, analysis of, of uh, CRISPR prevalence in uh, a small group of bacteria and archaea. And uh, it's, it's clear that uh, even, th even though the super kingdom, whether it's bacteria or archaea, uh, or, or temperature have some information content in, in determining whether there's CRISPR or not. There's a strong uh, element of, of stochasticity, uh, although the temperature is, is a better correlate with, with the, the prevalence of CRISPR. Um, so the, it, it's clear that because it's not ubiquitous, uh, there must be, uh, in addition to the, uh, the benefit that CRISPR provides, in protecting the prokaryotes from viruses, there's a, fit, there's a fitness cost. And the, the cost comes from uh, several sources. For example, uh, you could think of, of CRISPR blocking, uh, since, since CRISPR blocks all external foreign DNA, it can also block be uh, beneficial gene transfers. Uh, occasionally, it is found that uh, the CRISPR cassette uh, has bits of, its, of the, uh, the prokaryotes' own DNA. So when the CRISPR uh, is activated, the cell essentially commits suicide by destroying its own DNA. Um, and also, in, in prokaryotes where uh, genomic real estate is, is a premium, carrying around extra 50 to 100 genes is, is an expense in itself. So the, uh, since it has a, a clear benefit and uh, has a cost, 
whether a particular uh, species has it or, or does not have it, it depends on, on some specific condition of, of uh, which pits the benefit against the, the cost. And, um, and uh, we, we would like to understand under which conditions the, uh, the uh, benefit outweighs the cost. And the way to do it is, of course, to, uh, to model it. And because, the, as we saw, there's a strong element of stochasticity, uh, it, it, it will have to be a stochastic population model of virus host coevolution with explicit CRISPR dynamics. The model we had here um, uh, did not have population dynamics. It had fixed po populations. And uh, so uh, to the, the model I'm, I'll be talking to you about today uh, transcends that limitation and has explicit CRISPR dynamics and explicit population dynamics. Because I'm a physicist, I, I like to uh, distill models to, uh, to the minimal set, or as, as what seems like the minimal set of ingredients that still keep the essential uh, physics of the phenomenon um, while discarding everything else. Uh, so in this model, the, the viruses are represented by uh, a, a fixed number of, the, of per spacers. And per spacers are just integers. Um, and they, they will all have to be distinct in each virus. And they're NV viruses. Whereas the hosts are represented by uh, their CRISPR cassettes. Uh, and they could be also, there's also a string of integers of varying sizes, and they could, could be duplicate. And the dynamics of the system proceeds via three processes. Uh, viruses degrade with a rate D. Um, so when, when there's a viral degradation, the virus is removed from the population. Hosts divide with the unit rate, which sets the unit of time, basically. And uh, when there's a, a, div a host division, the daughter cell loses spacers uh, with a per spacer probability L. Uh, this happens because uh, it, it's, it, it's been shown that for a spacer to be effective against a protospacer, there needs to be a perfect match. So a single mutation in the CRISPR cassette essentially deactivates uh, a spacer. So that's essentially a loss of a spacer. And uh, there's also, a, in a well-mixed approximation, there's a rate, uh, there's, there's an encounter rate with an encounter probability B uh, between hosts and viruses. And the outcome of, of, of encounters is uh, uh, it could be an immune encounter or a productive encounter. An immune encounter happens when uh, the, the host has a, has a spacer that matches a virus, or a spacer, or in the absence of a match with some innate immunity probability S. This S is essential because if, if S is zero, then all encounters are productive and, and you cannot pick up spacers. So when the, uh, so that, that the, um, when the uh, probability, when, when the encounter is immune, when the, when the bacterium survives, the virus is removed from the population, and uh, the bacterium uh, picks up spacers from this virus and, and inserts it into its CRISPR array with probability A, which is the acquisition probability per, per protospacer. When the encounter is productive, the bacterium is removed from the population, and the virus produces M virions with birth size M, and uh, in the process, it mutates its uh, protospacers to, to be able to escape immunity in the future with pro probability mu per protospacer. So you can see that there are eight parameters in this model, and it's uh, too many to, to keep track of. So uh, at least you, we need to, uh, in the end, to, to figure out what varying all the parameters does. Uh, but in this talk, I will fix these five of these va reasonable values and, and vary only the encounter rate, B, the, sp the uh, probability of spacer addition when there's a, an immune encounter, and the mutation rate, which allows viruses to escape immunity. Uh, and the preliminary data is that uh, varying these parameters does not change uh, things qualitatively, only quantitatively. So in the absence of, of, of CRISPR immunity, uh, what you get is a, is a, a canonical Lotka Volterra system, um, basically Hosts grow, viruses degrade, and these, these uh, terms have to do with interactions, productive and, and, and immune, uh, which is well known that there's a, a fixed point, and the, and the population sizes of, of viruses, viruses and hosts uh, are inversely proportional to this encounter rate B. Um, so th this encounter rate B uh, sets the, the, uh, the characteristic population size and therefore characteristic strength of fluctuations. Um, the, the larger the population size, the smaller the fluctuations. Uh, this this Lotka Volterra system is, is, uh, admits a, a constant of motion, and therefore this fixed point is not is, is only marginally stable. In fact, there's a you know, this is textbook stuff. There's a, a family of 
trajectories around the fixed point, periodic trajectories with, with a period 2 pi over square root of d in this case, uh, which is about 10 in, in, in my, um, in this, for the parameter I fixed. Another thing to notice is that the, uh, the, the population size of, of hosts diverges when the immunity S uh, reaches a critical value, which is less than one. It has to do with the birth size of the virus. Uh, at, at this, at this uh, value of immunity, the, uh, the, the mean productivity of the virus goes below one, and, and there's no longer a fixed point. And where, it doesn't matter where you start on, on the diagram, that the, uh, the outcome is, is the extinction of the virus. So, uh, but in, in, a, in a fine population, there are fluctuations, and we want to understand uh, how the fluctuations change the, this, the system, and how, of course, the addition of the, of the CRISPR immunity changes the system. So the, the, uh, this is uh, without CRISPR immunity, with just innate immu fixed innate immunity. Of course, CRISPR um, has its own dynamics. The CRISPR locus can grow, it can shrink, it can, uh, the product spacer content of the virus can change, the spacer content of the CRISPR cassette can change. Uh, so uh, so um, the, the natural question that arises, can CRISPR immunity, can adaptive immunity be, be modeled on a naive level by just uh, a single number, which is the uh, probability of an immune encounter? Uh, which will be greater than the base, than the innate immunity, but still just a, on the average probability of, of uh, an immune encounter. And the answer to that is, is uh, yes and no. And, and for some things, it's, uh, it does make sense. For others, it does not. So it's, it's, it's been shown that uh, for a lotka volterra system with fluctuations, with, with, a, with, a, constant, with a finite population size, the, uh, the system, uh, there's a stochastic extinction. And the mean lifetime, lifetime of the system scales linearly with the population size. Remember, the, uh, the population size was inversely proportional to this encounter rate. And uh, when, when, the, when the addition probability is zero, that means there's no CRISPR. Um, and it, it's indeed, indeed, we just confirm what other people have found. However, there is a, um, when, when CRISPR is operative, when, when the, uh, there's some addition and some mutation rate, uh, it, and initially, for small populations, CRISPR stabilize the system, so the, uh, there's much longer coexistence of virus and host in the system. But, but uh, as, as the viral population size and, and increases, the, uh, the CRISPR becomes le less effective. And eventually, I think, this curve will, will uh, asymptote to this curve. So that the, uh, in, an infinite, in the limit of infinite population size, for this particular addition rate, the CRISPR becomes ineffective in the, lo in the large population size limit. Um, Another th thing that I want to point out here is the uh, when the system becomes extinct, I, I can figure, I can record uh, whether the bacteria or the virus become become extinct. And uh, without CRISPR, uh, it, the virus always wins. This is the probability of, of the virus being cleared or the bacteria winning. Uh, whereas um, for intermediate values of the uh, spacer addition probability, as I said, uh, CRISPR becomes ineffective for large population sizes. But there, is, there exists a critical, critical uh, um, addition probability. If you add spacers quickly enough, then what happens is that you acquire immunity that becomes strong enough to clear the virus in 100% of the cases. So, and and uh, that it's not surprising because uh, there exists a critical immunity even without CRISPR. So uh, if, if, the, if CRISPR is effective enough, the uh, effective immunity provided by CRISPR can reach this, this value and clear the virus. So, um, so, so let me ask you a basic question. What do you simulate? Do you simulate the stochastic loss of the operation, or do you simulate the population of the virus? Do you simulate I simulate this model using Gillespie. Okay, so these, these are actual cells of virus? Yeah, they, these are actual. I have a population of viruses and a population of hosts, and I, I perform these encounters. And I, perform, I, I basically go through this program over and over again using Gillespie. Right, so th there's a point I want to make here. Uh, because there exists uh, an acquisition, space acquisition probability that protects the, the host completely, you would think that if you allow the, the, uh, the host to evolve the acquisition probability, they will evolve to, to a state where they clear out the virus. And uh, this, this will be important later. Uh, it turns out that this system is, is really not a lot of Volterra system. There's lots of richness in the system, which we don't understand yet. Uh, this, I'm just going to show you a few examples of the richness that, that is encountered in, in, this, in the system. Uh, what you would expect is uh, if, if, if by the assumption of, of the mean uh, 
immune counter probability is correct, what you would see is that fluctuations are around the mean here. Whereas, in fact, you see for some uh, reasonably large uh, parameter range, you see a l slow oscillations. So these uh, fast oscillations are Lotka Volterra oscillations. Um, but on top of this, the fast oscillations, you see slow oscillations in, in immunity with, by an, almost an order of magnitude, the uh, length of the CRISPR cassette, the diversity of the viral population, and the host population, and the viral population also go through these large um, uh, slow oscillations with a period of about 30 times Lotka Volterra period. We don't understand this yet. In another parameter regime, uh, what, what, is, what we see is uh, um, an excitable medium-like behavior where the, uh, the system oscillates around uh, a mean, uh, performs small excursions around the mean, and every now and then it performs a very large excursion. This is reminiscent of, say, heart cells or any sort of excitable medium, which is either driven or it can perform stochastic uh, long excursions. And uh, here's this, this uh, excursion in detail. Uh, so the, the adaptive immunity sits at a very low value. And, and uh, I think we, we still don't understand what's really happening. But we, we think that uh, a series of bottlenecks in the host population uh, results in the uh, survival of the, the hosts that have the longest CRISPR loci. That, uh, and, and as a result, the, uh, the adaptive immunity begins to rise. The CRISPR locus begins to uh, so CRISPR locus size rises, and uh, it actually looks like this, the viral diversity is, 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 precedes the rise. So we don't understand this yet. So what we, we'd like to finally to uh, end up with is a, is, a, is, a, is a reduced description which integrates over uh, integrates the fast degrees of freedom out and is, re, is, is left with some slow degrees of freedom that uh, are described by some differential equations, like the Fitzhugh-Naguma description, if that tells you anything. Um, so, but, but from now on, so I showed you this, the system is really rich. And, and in the rest of the talk, I'm going to ignore this richness. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to average over time. I'm going to pr uh, uh, produce uh, quasi-steady state properties averaged over a long time. And uh, it turns out that these uh, quasi-steady state properties are quite simple. Um, what I'm plotting here is the adaptive immunity, the probability of, of, of having a, a match between a spacer and a protospacer. As a, uh, and uh, here, all the, all the dots are, have all possible parameter values in, over large, broad re regions of parameter regimes, and they all collapse into a, a single master curve. Uh, and the master curve uh, is, is the following. It's, it says the following. Since on the horizontal axis, I have the number of distinct protospacers in the viral population, divided by the length, the mean length of the CRISPR cassette. What this says is that the only thing that matters in, in predicting adaptive immunity is uh, how many distinct protospacers there are in the population, the viral population, per my, my spacer if I'm, if I'm a host. So what it says is that the spacers and the protospacers are distributed at random among the hosts and, 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 the, and viruses. So, the only thing that matters is how many of them there are and how long my CRISPR is. So if I, said, if I told you that varying B, mu, and A only moves me up and down this curve, how, how, how would changing other parameters move me? This is a speculation at this point. And I think none of the other parameters will, will move me off this master curve except for the um, number of viral protospacers. So, because uh, the, the, the protospacers come in a package of, of NS protospacers, the length of the virus, basically. Um, if, if, if the virus is longer, uh, the probability of finding a particular protospacer there is larger. So if, 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 yeah, if I increase the, increase the virus size, then this curve should move to the right. So uh, with this, the same number of, of, of vir distinct, dis number of distinct protospacers in the viral population and the same CRISPR length, I will have a higher immunity. Because all the protospacers are packaged together in the same virus. In, in a, I mean, in, in a sense, if the, vi if the virus length goes to infinity, then every virus has all the protospacers, and I'm, Im I'm immune to all the viruses. And, and the, so, uh, we would like to um, compute this, the shape of this master curve from first principles, or from we would like to predict the shape from uh, the parameters of the model, from the basic parameters of the model. And to do that, we need to understand how the number of distinct protospacers and, and the CRISPR length depend on the parameters of the model. Um, 
Well, it turns out that the, the, the story there is also quite simple. The, uh, the viral the, uh, per, uh, diversity, the number of prospacers in the, in, the, in the viral population, is almost the same as if the virus uh, evolved under no selection whatsoever, just a random mutation. Uh, it's slightly depressed because uh, there is some negative selection on, on a, on a prospacers that are present in the hosts. But however, the, uh, the, the protospacers cannot evolve by themselves. They're packaged together into a package of NS protospacers. And therefore, even, even if uh, one of them happens to be in all the hosts, you, you cannot be purged from, from the system because it's attached to all the other protospacers. Therefore, the selection is quite weak. And uh, the, the viral diversity is only reduced by 10 15% from its, its maximum limit uh, under no constraint whatsoever. And this. This uh, diversity, basically the number of, of different distinct protospacers in the population, uh, viral population, should be computable analytically. Um, and uh, we know I, 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 I'm working on this, how to do this. I, I know how to do it when each virus only has a single protospacer. However, the cal calculations is much more complicated when there are NS of them. And I, eventually, this, this will be part of the, the solution. So the, the other ingredient in, in predicting the master curve of adaptive immunity is, is uh, how the CRISPR locus behaves with parameters of the model. And uh, we can compute it under a, a certain unrealistic assumption that, uh, as I showed you, uh, it's not real realistic, but we, we're going to make it anyway, that the, uh, each host has a fixed probability of P of, of an immune encounter with the virus. If that is the case, then uh, the uh, total length of the CRISPR locus obeys a very simple equation. There's a term, uh, loss term, due to uh, bacteria host division and loss. And this is a, uh, an acquisition term, which has to do with the rate of uh, immune encounters, and this is the acquisition rate and the virus size. And in the steady state, if you plug in the, uh, the Lotka Volterra steady state uh, for, for the viral population, what you get is a very simple formula that, that relates the CRISPR locus size in, in steady state and the fraction of immune interactions. And this is the red curve over here. And you can see that, uh, as, as is expected, it under, under predicts the CRISPR locus size because in, in, there is a positive correlation. The longer the locus the stronger the immunity, even in the same population. But what I assumed is that in the same population, the locus length is uncorrelated with the, with the immunity. Um, but it, even though it underpredicts it, it, it doesn't do so badly. So you, if, you, if, you, if you take this prediction and put it together with the calculation of the viral diversity, what this should yield in the end is the, is the prediction for the shape of this master curve, which uh, I, since this is a very recent project, I don't have yet. But it will be uh, there. So uh, I would like to circle back now and bring bring this discussion back to the uh, the the, um, the theme of this conference, and also bring it back to the uh, observation that thermophiles are, uh, are more likely to have CRISPR. Uh, and, and for that, I need to consider what happens when you have three species: uh, hosts that have CRISPR, viruses, and hosts without CRISPR. And as I said, uh, CRISPR incurs a cost. So CRISPR minus hosts grow faster with a rate 1 plus C, where C is the cost. But CRISPR plus hosts, even though they grow with rate 1, have a higher immunity, P. So what, what that means, it turns out, in, in the uh, infinite population, uh, there's uh, frequency-dependent selection that uh, results in a coexistence in the range of, of costs. But in, in a stochastic uh, um, problem, when there's a finite system size, there's stochastic extension. So what, what you do in that case is you perform uh, an evolutionary experiment where you, you introduce a single host into a, a steady state system of other hosts, and you compute the invasion probability, the fraction of, 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 event, of, of uh, simulations in which this single host overtakes the system. And if, if the, uh, the product of, the, uh, of this invasion probability and the population size is greater than 1, it is said that the uh, the invading host is favored by selection because one over n would be the uh, neutral uh, result. If, 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 there's, if it's completely neutral, then the probability of invasion is one over n. And you do the same thing for CRISPR uh, plus introductions. Um, so when, when you introduce a CRISPR plus host into the population of CRISPR minus hosts, uh, notice that because they're introduced without spacers, initially they always have a lower growth rate. So, uh, but in, it turns out in the end, that they, because they are able to acquire spacers, they, they in, fact, in fact can invade. And what, what happens is um, um, 
when, when the mutation, so now, now I'm showing the invasion probability of plus hosts, the invasion probability of minus hosts, scaled by, by the population size. So values greater than one, uh, plus hosts are favored by selection, and values greater than one, the minus hosts are favored by selection. Um, and you can see that if, if the mutation rate is low enough, the, the, the plus host can invade the minus host, the minus host cannot invade the plus host, as, as expected, and the mutation rate of the virus is, is high, the plus host cannot invade, so the virus mutates too quickly, the CRISPR is not effective enough, uh, and the, uh, the minus hosts can, can invade uh, when the mutation rate is high, um, because the CRISPR is not effective enough. And the, 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 the threshold values for the, uh, of the mutation rate uh, for the uh, invasion of plus and the invasion of minus scale with uh, the addition and the population size as, as expected. There's, there's no, no surprises there. So now I'm going to summarize and, and make some speculative statements about what this means for, for cooperation. Um, so let me just first state what the model does. And uh, it, it, it shows um, complexity way beyond the standard Lotka Volterra, like the slow oscillations and excitable medium, which perhaps could be observable in some experimental systems of, of virus host coevolution. Um, the steady state, nevertheless, uh, is, is very simple. If you average the immunity over time, uh, it only depends on the, the number of spacers uh, in, the, in the CRISPR locus and the number of photospacers in the viral population, both of which we could start to, uh, to uh, address by experimental means. The number of photospacers could perhaps be obtained from metagenomics analysis, and the number of spacers is just uh, of trying to figure out what, the, the, the boundaries of the CRISPR locus and uh, the spacer are delineated by the uh, palindromic repeats. So in, the, in principle, you could count the number of spacers and, and, uh, and compare the, uh, the, the, the empirical values to, to the prediction. Um, so because the viral diversity is, is very close to the free evolution limit and the CRISPR length can be uh, estimated by very simple assumptions, we can put these together into a theory, an approximate theory of, the, of, this, of this model and, and actually predict this, this shape of the master curve analytically. Uh, then there will be a complete solution of the, of the model and uh, um, the comparison with experiment will be uh, uh, without para fitting parameters. Now here's the, the speculative part. Um, because CRISPR hosts can in, uh, resist invasion by more fit CRISPR minus hosts, um, but, the, but, they, but to do that, they need a viral population. Basically, the, what, I, what I would say is that the CRISPR plus hosts can use the virus as a weapon against the CRISPR minus hosts. Um, and to do that, what they need to do is they need to restrain themselves from not evolving immunity that's, that's large enough that will, it will vi wipe out the virus, viruses. The same could be said about the viruses. The viruses uh, shouldn't evolve a, a mutation rate that's too high that will wipe out the host, but that, that is true even in a virus host binary system, because then the, vi the host will, will be uh, extinct as well. So basically, uh, the, uh, what, so what, what, what you can say is that the CRISPR survives via group selection. So if you, have, if you imagine an experiment where uh, a group of CRISPR plus hosts are uh, repeatedly invaded by CRISPR minus hosts, uh, the one that uh, uh, evolves uh, a mechanism to control immunity is the one that will survive in the end. Um, the, uh, and, and another, uh, connecting it to the uh, uh, um, prevalence of, of CRISPR in thermophiles is uh, dependence of these invasion probabilities on the mutation rate ex explains, the, uh, might explain the prevalence in, in, uh, in thermophiles because it is known that mutation rate observed, mutation fixation rates in, in, in high temperatures are, are lower so if you, uh, if you see here, when the mutation rates are lower, CRISPR has easier time invading and easier time resisting invasion from CRISPR minus hosts. So if you, if you assume that uh, the virus uh, has a lower mutation rate in uh, high temperatures, then that will make the CRISPR system more effective and therefore CRISPR more prevalent. Thank you very much for your attention. In uh, 
there's a there's a there's an idea that in uh, in well mixed populations versus spatially structured populations, you might expect a different viral load, um, uh, particularly because of virus dispersal is limited if you can't move, and people have observed consistency with that. So um, that soil microbes typically you try and find viruses, you just don't very easily. Whereas in you know, the ocean, as we saw earlier today, that basically it's just one viral soup. Um, so do you see consistency with that with respect to the distribution of CRISPR? And, and that's one. And two would be, so one of the benefits of HGT, horizontal gene transfer for bacteria is, is when they're in a tritrophic interaction, when they're trying to evade the host immune response. And so you might also expect to see a consequence of that with respect to the, the costs of, of CRISPR as well. Yes. Yes, I, I think what, um, the, to answer your first question, um, if the dispersal of the virus is impeded, I think if effectively that would just translate into a lower encounter rate. So it would just be a lower population size, which makes CRISPR more effective. And the other one, I, I don't. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Carriots have other types of immunity, adaptive immunity. Well, yeah, I know. Yeah. I, have, I don't think so. That's right. If the yeah, you 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 got it. The, if the mutation rate of the virus is 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 high enough, then CRISPR will not be effective at all because you essentially you'll never see the same virus twice. Go ahead. So this is this is about your point about the um, healthy viral population, which is very intriguing. Now, this raises a question about the model. It would seem that it, it requires a feedback loop that the CRISPR is more effective if the viral population uh, increases. 
and conversely gets less effective in order to generate sort of a stable viral population. Well, I does didn't does say your model con contain this or can no, no, it's extra, to extra model. The the, uh, the, mo the mechanism for the bacteria for the host to evolve um, controls on its immunity is not in the model. I mean, all, all that is required is that the immunity of the of the host be in the in the regime in which there is stable coexistence of viruses and hosts. So, if if you didn't have controls, the, it's it's advantageous for the for the host to evolve higher immunity and clear out the viruses. So the the uh, selfish host, uh, the cheater, so, so to speak, would have a higher immunity, would protect itself, but uh, you know if, if everybody's a cheater, then the virus is wiped out, and the next Cas minus infection wipes out the Cas plus. I don't think anybody's done the direct computation experiments where you knock out CRISPR. A virus, yeah. It, has, it hasn't been done, no. Well, CRISPR has only been discovered less than 10 years ago. Yes. So I, I was wondering, did I hear that there you, that there was a statement about antitoxin toxin not occurring in eukaryotic systems? So for sure they do, right? So antitoxin toxin systems for sure do occur in eukaryotes. I'm not sure if I heard that quite right way back here. Okay, that specific one. Yeah, but okay. Okay, and and so on. Also on the. No one, I don't know if anybody's done the CRISPR one, but the toxin, anti-toxin system knockout and doing a selection experiment, people have done those. And, uh, uh, and there was no benefit. So, in bacteria, yeah. That's why they're not published. <laughs> huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, how do you know what the right environment is? Is always the problem, right? So that so. Going on there is it doesn't work, or they're moving around, or they're 
environment? Well, it could be that there's a cost associated with CRISPR. And so there are conditions under which uh, the, the CRISPR-less bacteria can invade. It could also be that uh, the, there are conditions under which CRISPR is ineffective altogether. So when it's ineffective, it would also be lost even without CRISPR minus competition. So what, the, what the outcome of this model is that the CRISPRs are going to finish a therapy intermediate viral regression and intermediate viral growth. They are no good for the encounter. No viral and indeed they are useful. So I actually had a question. Uh, so you mentioned that a cheater in this system would be one that kind of has too good of immunity, right? Wipes out the virus. Uh, now, if you assume that CRISPR is costly and that you could have one that benefits from one that's actually, so you could have one that isn't as good at CRISPR that has a benefit of avoiding some of the cost uh, of CRISPR. So in that case, the cheater would be one with a not as good immune function, in which case the existence of cheaters would actually allow the virus to persist. I then you wouldn't you, need you had, group selection. <laughs> I mean, uh, what I understand is either you have CRISPR or you don't have CRISPR. I, I can't. I imagine of an intermediate state where okay. you have some some of the benefit and some of the cost. Perhaps. But what he's suggesting is a, is a cheater phenotype. No, I, I know, yeah, I know, okay. Good suggestion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.